The news is how we find out what's happening in the world. It's how we form our opinions. Opinions based on facts. That's the key, facts. Facts should be delivered to you by journalists based on the truth. But what if what they're delivering you isn't the truth? What if it's stories that are manipulated to make you think a certain way, to follow a certain narrative, different people's agendas? And what do they do to those who go against that mainstream narrative? Those who try to expose the truth? This is a documentary about the lengths they will go to to shut down and silence anyone from bringing you, the British public, the truth. I lost my job over this. non disclosure agreement. He's a nasty little piece of shit. Swung the hockey stick over his head and hit me in the spine with it. Well, it's all dead, isn't it? This kid was out unconscious already. That's just malicious. I'm not standing, you're not going, but No, because no, what you're doing, I know what you're doing. Tommy, I am going to mince your kids, mate. This is a documentary about the unholy alliance between the media, the justice system, and our politicians. How they conspire to suppress free speech, how they pervert democracy, and how the truth and your freedoms are just two of the casualties. We will show how the mainstream media deceives people, how they ignore the truth, how the lies of the virtue signaling BBC, ITV, and Channel 4 are all about their poisonous agenda, no matter the cost to innocent people. It's also a documentary about how an everyday playground incident between two young lads was spun into global news at a terrible cost to so many people, not least the two young lads themselves. We will show how the law is being abused, how people driven by hateful ideologies attempt to intimidate and silence anyone who dares to challenge the so-called progressive, so-called liberal narrative. We will show the foolishness of our fear-driven political leaders who jumped on a story, took a side without knowing the truth. Or worse still, knowing it but hiding it because the truth didn't fit their narrative, regardless of the human cost. And we'll ask three important questions. Firstly, is the media accountable to anyone in any way for what they report? Years after the Leveson inquiry, has anything changed or do they continue to act with impunity? Secondly, is our legal system still fit for purpose? We will show how lawyers who hate Britain but love jihadi warriors have weaponized the law system against us and how the legal system really only works for the rich. And finally, how do we keep our politicians accountable? If the police, the courts and the state can silence anyone for speaking inconvenient truths, truths that may raise questions about government policy, is the UK any different from China, Russia or Iran in their treatment of dissidents. And of course, for Piers Morgan, for Jeremy Fine, for the BBC ITV and Channel 4, it's a tutorial on journalism. Keep watching it, you'll learn a lot. Our story appears to start and end in a brief playground incident at Ormondbury Community School in Huddersfield. A playground scuffle. One boy poured a bottle of water on another child, the school dealt with it, and that should have been that. Three weeks later, however, a video clip of the incident surfaced and within hours, with the help of lawyers and the ignorant rantings of ITV's Piers Morgan and the BBC's Jeremy Vine, it was made into global news event. And the lives of so many people were turned upside down. Such playground incidents happen every day. So why was this spat between two boys transformed into global news? Well, one of the boys was white and the other a Syrian refugee. At which point the truth of the matter was buried beneath an avalanche of agendas and opportunism. Within hours, the race hate brigade was sharpening their blades. Well, clearly when somebody comes from Syria, fleeing Assad's regime, coming to a place like this, when they get treated that way, that's an issue. And the whole world is looking at us. Where are we? We're in Almondbury. I, do I say the scene of the incident? Is it a scene in is the incident? It's the scene of the great lie. I call it the great lie because this lie was pushed around the globe. Yeah? This here is the school where the world was told a Syrian refugee was waterboarded by a racist English bully. It was in a playing field here. And do you know what? This is the first time I've been here. Because when this blew up on the news, it's a child's school. Kids are in school. I didn't come outside here. You'd see the scenes outside here where the Imam was here with mobs of men, yeah? mobs of Muslim men 
extremists travelled up from London, such as Ali Dawa, to cause a scene outside this, this kid's school. Anyway, but I'm here. Why am I here? I'm here because I face a court case. I'm being prosecuted. It's gone, it's gone to the High Court. And I have to prove, I made a video stating that it was a lie, stating that Jamal wasn't innocent, and telling some facts about Jamal beating up girls, an instance that I'd been warned about by the members of this community to tell the truth about what happened at this school. I've got to prove it in court. So I've come to Huddersfield. I'm now going to knock. I need to find witnesses. I've got addresses for many. Um, I need to knock and talk to them and see who I can get to come to court to help me prove to you, the public, this is about as much as proven in court as proving to you, the British public, that I was the only journalist in the country who told the truth about what happened in this community. The story you were told. You were told that a vulnerable Syrian child refugee had been bullied and waterboarded by a nasty white boy. You were told it was a racist attack. You were told of the dangers of far-right extremism. You were invited to agree that this kind of intolerance could not be tolerated. Was he vulnerable? Was it a racist attack? Our evidence shows the answers to both these questions was no. Was the Syrian lad waterboarded? Why was this word used? What about this? <laughs> was that waterboarding? Take a look at this. Wait, wait, go. shows a group of non-white children beating up a white girl. It went viral online, but it wasn't touched by the mainstream media. It wasn't made into a global story. Why not? Meanwhile, the usual suspects had lit the fire and were gleefully stoking the flames. Everybody was exposing the scumbag that did this, who I hope gets severe retribution. And of course, the politicians. They're always quick to jump on the bandwagon. Theresa May, Sajid Javid, Naz Shah, Nicholas Soames, Winston Churchill's grandson. Such moral outrage. And it's not just the media and the politicians. In today's Twitter and Facebook driven worlds where celebrities and groups compete to virtue signal, most of them driven by the warm feeling they get by expressing their moral outrage or by fear. The fear of what might happen to them if they don't. Everyone who's anyone pumped the Bailey Jamal story. Boxers, Lennox Lewis, Huddersfield Football Club, celebrities from across the globe. Let's have a look at all of the celebrities and blue tick brigade who pumped the Jamal story. And here are some of the people who pumped the story you watched earlier of the white girl getting beaten up. Sadly, whether it's politicians, celebrities or other groups, none of them are wise enough or pause long enough to ask whether they have the whole story, to check the facts, to find the truth. But why let the truth get in the way of such a good story? And this story was just too good a story. Two lads in a playground scrap is not international news. But racist white thug, waterboards, helpless Syrian refugee, boom! Racism can't be tolerated, beware of the far right. That's their kind of story. We'll hear more about the Miller and Left later, but they clearly weren't going to miss out on this. Well, we're, re we're re representing might be too harsh a word, but I'm 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 I'm, I'm here as as a concerned citizen. Mohammed Amin Pandor, a mufti on a mission, he rushed to Ormondbury from his mosque in Batley, a town at the far end of the district. In fact, there's 40 mosques closer to this school. But perhaps Mufti Pandor had his own agenda. You see, his little brother, Councillor Shabir Pandor, is the leader of Kirkley's council in Huddersfield. And they were having some pretty bad news days at that time. By the way, Mufti Pandor, he's the same guy who ordered the Islamic mob to come to the school in Batley and demand the sacking of the RE teacher who showed a cartoon of Mohammed in a discussion about free speech. Look, look at what we do as a community and you'd understand our stance. So what has happened is totally unacceptable. Yeah, and we have made sure that the school understands that. The teacher has been suspended. The teacher has been suspended. You may recall the teacher had to flee and he's still in hiding under police protection. Luckily, he hasn't ended up like Samuel Patty 
the French teacher who was beheaded for having a similar discussion in a classroom about free speech. You see, free speech is essential for any society wishing to maintain intellectual and social progress. But not all societies are bothered about intellectual and social progress. Should we be silenced by the demands of Mufti Pandor and Sharia law? Should we sacrifice our freedom of speech? Should we sacrifice the free and open exchange of ideas? Should we sacrifice the cultural inheritance of which we are all custodians? But back to the bad news days in Kirklees and the playground incident in 2018. There was also Kirklees councillor Masood Ahmed. I'm not aware of there's a problem at the school. That's something obviously I need to find out in terms of that there is a problem at the school and that is something I will definitely be picking up. Now, some of you may remember this. My colleagues are going to explain what's going to happen next, right? Am I being arrested? Okay. I am being arrested. I was in a breach of peace. I'm, I've, caused a, of the, uh, I'm, I've caused a breach of peace. I'm being arrested. arrested. But the content of what you're uh, Can we just streaming... Say the the content of what I'm streaming... What I'm, told, I'm being arrested for breach of the peace. I'm being arrested yeah. for breach of the peace. You've all watched this. You've all watched this. You've all watched this. You've all watched this. Can you get me a slitter? Can you get me a slitter? Can you just turn up your light feed? Can you get me a slitter? Turn up your light feed, please. Yeah? Do you understand what I just said? No, can you explain it again? What, what does that mean? What, what does that mean? At the same time as this playground spat between two young lads, 20 Huddersfield men were being jailed across Yorkshire at Leeds Crown Court for what would be the biggest grooming gang Britain has ever seen. Ultimately, 35 almost exclusively Muslim men would be given 380 years in prison for grooming, trafficking and raping young children, most of whom were known to Councillor Pandora's Kirklees Council. Mufti Pandor travelled for half an hour to rabble-rouse a gang outside the school gates over this playground incident. When within a couple of mile radius in Batley, police have arrested a further 99 men in relation to historic sex crimes. So far, 32 have been charged, including one Ibrahim Pandor, 41 of Batley. That makes it the highest destination of grooming gang arrests anywhere in the UK. We Googled to see what Mufti Pandor has said about these grooming gang atrocities. Nothing. We Googled to see what Councillor Masood Ahmed's condemnation. Nothing. In fact, we can't find the condemnation from the Mufti's brother either, Councillor Shabir Pandor, leader of the council. Just one statement from him, reported in June 2019, telling the National Working Group of Child Sexual Exploitation Response Unit that his authority had moved forward. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> They've moved on. Never mind grooming gangs, gang rape of young children, all these men seem to be far more concerned about what happened in a playground at Ormelbury Community School, or about cartoons of their prophet Muhammad. I think I now realise how difficult this is going to be, because everyone we've spoke to today, they're all confirming what I said was true, everyone's confirming what Jamal was like, including school staff, but as soon as I mention this camera, as soon as I mention court, I need someone to come to court, they just totally silence straight away. No, we, no, no one can know I've said that. I need to show the public everything that I've heard today. I need the public to hear and know the truth. I need them to know how much they've been lied to by the media about what happened in this town. And uh, the only way, unfortunately, the only way I'm going to be able to do that is with hidden cameras. Because today, I've heard the truth, but I need every one of you to know the truth. And everyone's too scared. That's why I said Project Fear. Everyone is too scared to speak the truth or to come to court. So I'm gonna end up getting, I'm gonna end up getting hammered in court. The whole world told I've lied when I haven't. I was the only journalist in the UK who told the truth. So we need to prove it. So we'll shoot down the motorway now. We'll go get these hidden cameras. These are all, so this is a tie. There's a camera in that. That's the camera. Mad, isn't it? That's the camera there. This today, that's the camera. I'll have to take this off, but it doesn't matter because apparently this records all the audio, records everything. That's the camera and I feel a little bit dirty doing this, but it is the only way I'm gonna get people to speak. And then I need you to hear what I hear. The idea that people would maraud the streets looking for him was appalling. The fact that the video itself um, 
although it showed the accumulation of things that are built up to that um, did not deserve what happened to him or to anybody else in that situation and I'm afraid the media uh, I call it a perfect storm I was getting uh, emails from Pakistan from Australia from America telling me to resign so it went worldwide and I'm afraid I came into teaching to help poor people and they got rid of me I've got a problem here um, I lost my job over this and as a result the council has told me that I cannot speak to anybody ever about it so I can't discuss it I can't discuss it with the media I've always wanted to have my say against it, yeah. which I've never had um, never been allowed to have never been allowed to say goodbye to my staff was just told to leave so I worked there nearly 30 years at tw sorry 20 years and never got a card never got a goodbye this whole thing was just used the whole thing was used yes. to push them in and the hijacked and <laughs> by, by, by the right of the political I'm quite a political person by yep. the right and the left it was hijacked and spun all out of proportion and now we've got problems but essentially what I thought so what, what you'll meet is a wall of silence what a so mess it is a, it is a mess but, but it's a tragedy it's a tragedy for Bailey um, I'm not sure Jamal will get anything out of this ever in his life uh, positive out of it either necessarily he might have he might have got a few uh, silver coins from Judas but that's about it you know that, that's it the thing is that the incident happened six weeks prior or weeks prior and then on the same day at the same time I've looked at the timings the GoFundMe set up the statement's released yeah, now you see you're putting the picture together and then they've built up I couldn't comment on that but you've got a little, you've got a little picture there mm. already that's gold yeah I know that's gold all I hope I hope that's recorded I can't turn the computer on so I just pray that's got the audio and the visual and it's not pointing up there that we've got it because that was the head teacher and that's the first visit and I know this is going to work. It's exciting. Was there a racism problem in the school? And well, no, I, I, no. Don't, I, I don't think um, there was. Well, so what about other Syrian refugees? Like, do, do you think what happened to Jamal yeah. in the school was because he was a Syrian refugee? No, not at all. I told you before that that would have happened no if, the, if the child was white, big, blue, whatever colour. They're all scared. Yeah. Well, the careers, aren't they? Oh, I no. work for a probation service now. You do now. Yeah. So I don't know where I stand with it. If I go, I could lose my job. So they seem to be pretty keen on these NDAs. Yeah. Who is that? Turkish Council. But I can't disclose that with you. Like what? Lords. I'm saying I can't disclose it because I, yeah. I signed it. That incident was talked about by Theresa May at a G20 summit. And we asked her a question about it. We were then offsteaded by five of the top inspectors in the country. We only sent one registered inspector. We had the head of safeguarding. We had, I had Amanda Spielman, the head of Ofsted, speaking to me about it. If you want my honest opinion, they said, get up there, this is, I don't know who they is, yeah. get up there and shut that school. Get up there and get rid of this. Get rid of the problem. Over the pain. Correct. Over your mouth. Correct. Get up there and get, get rid of it. But why do you think that is? Do you think, because I looked at Jamal, Jamal, because he came here two years ago, I've got so many negative things said about him now by so many people. Well, I mean so many. Well, I mean I've got, I've got, I've got children at school. I've it to you before. Yeah. We had nine Syrian children, nine families. Yep. We only had one issue. Well, my, my view is yeah. that you won't get much of an answer out of Rob because he worked there and he's bound by various confidentialities, so... Non-disclosure agreements. Mm. Did he get paid as well? He's not going to come. They all have. Every teacher got paid not to tell the truth. But the head teacher can't even talk about Jamal at all. No, neither can I. Neither can you. What's your name? Well, if you work it out, it must be a good one, mustn't it? Oh, yeah. So, did you work there as well? No, I was the chair of governors there, but... So it's it's not. My, my issue is you're it? not going to get anywhere. Really. No, 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 yeah. And Rob wouldn't talk to you either, so it's. They're trying to. It's pointless me even giving you. I told, but I told the truth. Your contact details. Okay. Wouldn't work. I told the truth about what happened that day. I am not even arguing. His life was destroyed. Well, that's not fair either, is it? As a racist bully, and he won't. And he wasn't. 
I know. And I both know that. I know. But the truth is just. How much money is it? I can't say the figure because if I say the figure, okay. it goes out. Because, mate, 18. 18. I've just found out. Well, the head teacher's told us already that he was blackmailed and threatened. I've just found out of Kumar, he was paid 18,000 pounds. Paid, he said, I can't say, shh. I signed, I, I was paid. I said, paid what? He was paid money by the local council, so he can't tell the truth about what's gone on in that school. They, they, they've given everyone non-disclosure agreements, from school staff to governors, to, and, and Paul Kumar to get 18,000 pounds. He's not even involved. Silencing everybody, so no one can ever, this is forever, once you sign that agreement, no one can ever tell the truth. While they pushed this manufactured lie that destroyed lives, schools, communities, everyone's life. I've seen life after life after life, person after person's life destroyed, while the council, your local council, Kirkley's council, give away hundreds of thousands of pounds to make sure that the truth can never be told. I can't believe it. I knew from day dot, I asked myself the question, when this was blowing up and I knew the truth, I kept saying, how come no teacher's telling the truth? If all those teachers know what's gone on in that school, how come none of them are coming out and saying, well, now we know. Now the whole world's gonna know. Because Copley Council paid them not to. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Jamel was in your year? Yeah, um, he was in the same year as me. What was his, what was Jamel's attitude like at school? Um, he wasn't very nice. He called female teachers bitches. Um, he just didn't really have respect for the female students, to be honest. Um, yeah, basically, we were in a PE lesson and um, we were playing hockey with a teacher called Mr. Cattell and I had taken the hockey puck off of Jamal because I was on the other team and sent it to the other side of the room where my teammates were and I then turned around and just felt a really sharp pain in my back and he'd swung the hockey stick over his head and hit me in the spine with it. Is there, do you think there's any way that could have been an accident? No. It knocked me to my knees. It knocked you to your knees. How, how long had Jamal been at school when this happened? Uh, about two weeks. I ha I've had lasting injuries from it. It's caused me to have severe pain in my top in the top of my back and um, I'm on medication for the pain. Still now? Yeah. Did Jamel get in trouble for this? Um, not that I'm aware of. First I want to apologise to anyone I've been forced to record with a hidden camera. Sadly, people are terrified to tell the truth because of the potential consequences. But the truth still needs to be told. Do you know, do you remember of any, any incidents specifically with Jamel with dogs? Well, there was that one where he hit that girl with a hockey stick, wasn't it? Yeah, Charlie. Charlie. Yeah. I don't think of her name, then. Yeah, you must go. Lovely little girl, that. Yeah. Um, it was just rude to him, obnoxious, or bloody nasty. Like, no respect for ladies, no respect for girls. Yeah. Because I was like, he was like to the side of me, so he like tried like pushing me and like, so I quickly moved out there because obviously I knew what it was like, he would have actually hit me and stuff. Yeah. So I moved and then he like, that's when he like moved his arms if he was going to try to slap my face, like back. Okay. And he tried, but he did, uh, but on that day he spat at you multiple times. Mm -hmm. Where'd the spit go? Like literally all of my uniform at the side and all down the school bag. Because when I went home I told mum that my mum were disgusted in it. But the school said that because that, it was outside of school times, they can't really do much about it. Okay. <laughs> He's a nasty little piece of shit. Was he? Yeah. And dog. Uh, and I told you to listen to that when she rung me. Okay. She's a horrible boy. Is he? Yeah. And it's all that. What was he like at school then? Nasty. To? Everybody and anybody. He does. He, he had no respect for women at all. None. Did you even snap? Jamal grabbed him by his tie, which just threw him against the wall, cracked his head open against back at wall and just kept throwing him against the wall. This kid was out unconscious already. That's just malicious. Int that's just intent to kill. Were the they? Mm, they? They had um, a young lad and a girl, and 
they were absolutely, they were horrendous. The kids, they were just horrific. The, the couple of kids that they had, they used to bully the kids. What, Jamal? Kids. Yeah. See, what was, um, what was Jamal like though? The dickhead. Was he? He spent, he, he came to isolation a few times. He wasn't, he wasn't a perfect child. No, no. Yeah, I, he was portrayed. I, well, you know what job I did, don't you? He was in isolation? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In isolation, lots of times. Well, he, 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 he used to lie, lie a lot. But this whole thing was built off what he said, and if he lied a lot, it's a big problem. Yeah. What's that? It was quite a violent person. It, it was a violent person? Yeah. Like, so I was the year below, and he was a year above. Yep. He used to every time I walked past, I'd grab him in. Every time he walked past him? What about, um, your mum said something about, he put something in between his hands. Oh, yeah. It was a compass. I remembered it yesterday, just as you went. <laughs> it was a compass. It got... He got a compass and he was going around like, when he got to me, he went proper hard to me, made me bleed and everything. And I think it was Miss Ennis that proper gave him a top telling off to me. Okay. Well, there are testimonies from several children who alleged they were being bullied by him. Younger children, little girls, mostly girls. Is Jamal the innocent victim you've been told? I gathered these testimonies over just a few hours filming in Huddersfield. I could have carried on. Yeah, he was waiting outside his legend to be the yellow. And I'll about the about, lies. Yeah, I'll say about Duran, he used to tell fibs that several times he got investigated. Um, and he just fucking turned out to be fucking lies. The fact he always lied is a big point. The fact that you know that the police, the, the school investigated incidents where he said things happened. Yeah. And they turned out to be made up. Yeah, it was fibs. It couldn't have happened. It could have happened because of, 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 I think there one. The child wasn't even in school that he accused. I can remember. I know he said a couple of things to the kids. Yeah. You know, about what he was going to do to sisters and what have you. To Bailey. To Bailey and to yeah. others. Oh, and to others. But not a very nice boy. When you say, what was he going to do to the sisters? Well, he told Bailey he was going to rape them. Told Bailey he was going to rape his sister. Mm. Just to see what he was generally like. No, not a nice lad. Oh, right. And I've tried to argue that it was in the public's interest for him to know the truth about Jamal. Oh, yeah. And well, they was just retaliating. Yeah. You know, which most people do with somebody threatening with their sisters. Yeah. Younger. Yeah. Bullet. Do you know who Jamal? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm fine now. Yeah. That's what I remember. He said he was going to stab him with the science or something. Yeah. If I remember. He said, yeah, so he goes, come on then. What are you saying now? Because that thing of him getting caught with a knife in school, it's like, what? Caught with a knife and a screwdriver? Bailey gets his pelt for a bottle of water. Yeah. What the fuck? Surely he gets. Have you got a statement on that? Uh, no, because it, there's things missing. But I've got, I've got his dad mentioning it in the minutes of a meeting. His dad mentions it in the meeting with the school. His dad mentions about them catching him with a knife and a screwdriver. His, oh, da his dad brought it up. I've got, it, I've got it in black and white. Yeah, so you've got a good case there. I've got, I've got it. Yeah, he got caught with a knife. They, they can't deny it. You see, the truth was there for the media was there for celebrities and politicians to see. They could have told you the truth at the time, before some of you gave over £160,000 of your money to the poor victim, Jamal. Well, not so poor anymore. But none of this was true. A key part of this case is that I reported what I was told. Before my involvement in this story, a mother went online and said her daughter had been attacked by Jamal. I contacted that mother. She sent me images of her daughter. She said her little daughter was beaten by three Muslim girls and that Jamal jumped in and bit her daughter on the head. She sent me the images of the bite marks on her daughter's head. I said, can I speak to you? Can I interview you? I rang the mother, but the child was too scared to talk to me. She's scared. Oh no, everyone's scared. A girl went online and said that she had been attacked by Jamal. Both of these victims deleted their comments, why? Both of these victims have gone online and reported this before my involvement at all in this case. I simply reported what they were saying. We revisited the mother's house to try and get confirmation as to why she backtracked on the story she had put out and the story she had told me. I don't care if you're driving, Tommy Robinson's there. <laughs> Tell her not to worry, don't worry. He said don't worry. Yeah. yeah. So when you, when you put online about Jamal, what, yeah. what, what happened? Like what, did you what, what happened? What was the response to that? What do you mean? I mean, did you receive... Did, you receive any did I receive threats? Yeah, I did. What sort of threats? Uh, rape, all sorts. 
Half heart, Tom. Half heart. And I'm just could I want to try and understand is is that um and is that because and because what I've what I've looked at and then because Jamal's solicitors are using a statement that you made saying that our oh, Jamal had nothing to do with it, but was that I'm asking is that was that in response to the fr- refresh you see re- you received? Yeah, it was okay. I don't feel safe at school. Sometimes I say to my dad, I don't want to go to school anymore. I was just crying. And I didn't do nothing because I respect the school rules. He was put up on a pedestal by every single media outlet, politicians, footballers, celebrities, boxers, everybody. They're suing me for defamation for what I've said about him. All I'm knocking on the door and asking teacher after teacher after teacher is what was Jamal like? And it's just flowing. It's just boom. And he was far worse than anything I said, far worse. I find it insane because no, there is no way that all the things I'm now finding out that no other journalist has found this out. They must have known what it was like because it hasn't been hard. The idol portrayed Paul Bailey was disgusting. It really was. Because that's what I've spoken to loads of people who said, no, Bailey wasn't a bully. No, he wasn't. He wasn't I mean, racist. His mum had a bit of a gob, don't get me wrong, because they used to live up here. Yeah. Um, Bailey wasn't like that at all. He had two half-caste sisters, so how could he have been with uh, You know, but Bailey wasn't racist. So you were told Bailey was a bully, and he was a racist. He wasn't a saint in school. He'd be the first to admit that, but he wasn't a bully or a racist. The police concluded there was nothing racist about the scuffle. Yet you were told he was vermin. You were told he needed to be dealt with. He was vilified by the media, by politicians and by celebrities. Bailey a bully? Bailey a racist? Not according to his teachers and other children. Not according to his head teacher of his school. He was was a 15 year old kid and it, it would have been, could be, have a great future. He's a very articulate lad. He's got a lot of issue about justice. Yeah, I think, you know, I could have seen him being a lawyer or something like that because he had that in him. Really? Yeah. And he would stand up for his peers in school when he felt things were... Yeah. 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 You know, he would do that. But Bailey didn't even get to sit his GCSEs because of this campaign of hate, this perversion of the truth. What about Jamal's broken arm? Which the world was told was because of bullying. Eh. That was a lie. School incident reports record that he had been punching a much younger child in the face while holding him in a headlock, and he was pushed off him, fell and broke his arm. The police considered the incident to have been dealt with it properly. He started calling my mum a white fat bitch and stuff, and then he like... It's like calling you my mate. A white fat bitch. A white fat bitch. And then uh, I went up to him, and then he, like I chucked, I chucked a bottle at him, and then he put me in a headlock, and then my mate pushed him off me. And I believe that's how he broke his arm. Yeah. There's all sorts of misconceptions, like the fact that he had a broken arm. Um, oh, I've got two independent witnesses now. No, he hit a, a year eight kid. And another kid in year 11 stepped in and said, what are you doing? Pushed him over. Broke his arm. Who he had in the headlock. It was, must have been just start of year 11, put this kid in a headlock. One of my friends, weren't having it, didn't like how he was behaving, behaving. grabbed him and just threw him off him. Like, any, like anyone do break up a fight, they just like throw him off him, but this wasn't a fight. This was just an all out brawl, one sided, completely one sided. Because this kid had no match against Jamal. Just threw him off him and he How landed on the curb. Kid? How big was the kid? Uh, Jamal was in year 11. Yeah, half, half the size of Jamal easily. Okay. You know, I know he was 12 and Jamal mm. was 15. Mm. But it was like kind of like half size ish, kind of like up to the shoulders kind of thing. Yeah. But he still had no match against him. And my friend just grabbed him, threw him off him, and he landed on a curb. And that was about it. So I've read it reported in by Jeremy Vine and, and in the newspapers that mm. that was an incident of Jamal being bullied. No, exact opposite. He was bullying this kid. So you see, people thought that was all part of it. But that's because you know why they. Can somebody be thrown to the floor with a broken arm? But do you know, why they, do you know why they thought it was part of it? Because the solicitor said it was. No, well, it's, that's not true. That generally is not true. I could even name it, I won't, but I could name the child in year eight that he did it to. And I could name the child in year 11 that 
stepped in. So someone stepped in. Because basically the school schools a pretty good place. Kids have good values. So if you saw a bigger kid hitting a little kid, you'd say, oh, you'd step in and say, what are you doing? You're laughing. And we even had it where... Do you know what he said to the year eight kid? No. Called his mum a white slag? Yes. Now I've got that on camera as well. Now you say it, yes, he would have done that. And that would have been incredibly provocative for him. Even in his statement to court, Jamal claims they were forced to relocate from Huddersfield for their own safety to a different part of the country. Really? Because the records say there was no most racial motivation and there was no threat at home. That's what the records say. And this is why the authorities, they refused to move them. And while all this was going on, records also show that his dad, Jihad, yeah, his dad's his name is Jihad. He'd threatened to kill himself if the rest of his family weren't brought in from Syria. It's not surprising that some authorities expressed concerns that Jihad Hijasi was trying to manipulate the system to get what he wanted, including better housing. You were not told the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. You weren't told anything approaching the truth by the mainstream media. And in Jihad Holy War's statement to the court, Jihad said that he wished he had died in the war with his family rather than go through what happened at Almondbury Community School. Really? He wished he was dead and all his family were dead rather than go through this school playground incident. Listen to the clip again. Listen to what Bailey's saying. He's asking Jamal repeatedly, what are you saying now? It wasn't a random attack. It wasn't a racist attack. Bailey didn't threaten to stab Jamal. The playground incident was not the beginning of the story. It was a culmination of many events. Not least, it was a response to Jamal's alleged threats to rape Bailey's younger sisters. They were about nine years old at the time of this. So as a girl at that school, when you saw the portrayal of what happened with Bailey mm. and him, because uh, he was painted as this innocent little kid. He wasn't innocent. It's out in everyone. It's out in everyone. And I used to see him bully Bailey's little sisters and stuff, so... Everybody was exposing the scumbag that did this, who I hope gets severe retribution. I hope his parents take action, right? Never mind anything else. What, 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 what are you producing here with this vermin doing what he's doing here? That's not Britain. That's not what we do as a country. You can hear him there describe Bailey as vermin. Words are important when you're on a daytime platform and, and people listen to what you say. What do you do to vermin? You exterminate it. You kill it. Low life. Called him a thug. But worst of all, he demanded severe retribution against this child. At the same time as this, Jeremy Vine was reporting. He didn't tell people the bully's name, although he was finding it hard not to name a child. Instead, he told his followers where they could find that name. Now, this is a direct response of both of your reporting. Because when you reported, you can follow the timeline and the repercussions of what that bore. What I've done here, in 2018, there's a charity called Tell Mama that records Muslim hate incidents. They, even though they've been, in the past, penalised for exaggerating the figures, let's, go, let's work off their figures. They say there are over 1,000 hate incidents, with 325 of them being online. Some of them Islamophobic, which means criticising Islam as well. Here, I've printed a piece of paper for each one of those hate incidents. 327 hate incidents online against the entire Muslim community of the UK in 2018. The 325 Islamophobic comments, they're the ones you read about on the news every day. They're the ones people in jail for. They're the hate incidents the media keep shoving down your throat. So each piece of paper here represents a hate comment aimed at a child after a playground dispute. I want to read these now. Piers, you demanded severe retribution. That's what you demanded against this child. Let's see if you're happy with some of this. I pray someone rapes you and your whole family while you watch. Fuck your mother, fuck your love. The Syrians will rape your family. If I saw you, I would rape you to death. 
You will be raped by the Fallujian group. I hope your mother will not be racist when she is raped. I'm going to bum your nan alive, then dead her again. And the threats of rape, all of these threats of rape, imagine being these children. Imagine being a 15-year-old child living in Huddersfield with your little sisters. Muslim men are jailed in the biggest scandal in the, in the, in the history of our country for mass rapes in that town. And then you're receiving and you're read, re reading these messages. You're going to die. You're going to fucking die. We're going to strangle your mum, your dad, your friends. I'll kill your whole family. I can't wait to find you so I can slit your throat. You're the person who should be killed in those ISIS videos. You, your parents and your whole family have to be burned. Do everyone a favour and fucking off yourself. Looking at you makes me want to commit suicide. Go commit suicide, you, you oxygen thief. Jump off a bridge, bro. Do humans a favour and kill yourself. We don't want you and you don't belong in this world. Again, imagine being that child reading them. Piers. Is that severe enough for you? This is a mental health record for Bailey McLaren. Bailey was referred to Luton Cams by Luton and Dunstable Psychiatry Liaison on the 31st of December 2018. Reason, patient involved in incident in Huddersfield and has been relocated to Luton with family. Patient unable to cope with not returning home and has taken an overdose. So this lie, this narrative, this agenda which comes before anything else by the politicians, by the media that was pumped. This child, it doesn't matter. His life didn't matter. You know, if he killed himself, no one would have cared. We wouldn't have heard condemnation from any of the politicians or, or from any of the media. No one cared because everyone from start to finish in this story is collateral damage. So long as they have the narrative and peers, you have a son. You have children. Demanding severe retribution against a child for a school playground dispute is unforgivable. You sit there and you preach. You preach against us. You, you make your accusations against me. Never have I labelled Muslim children as vermin. Never have I demanded my followers to commit severe retribution against anybody. And this is what the media, the politicians, and the celebrities created, aided and abetted by the left-wing activism and the selective indignation of Islam. Hypocrites out there might say, who cares? That's what he deserved, right? Imagine for one moment if I had incited violence against a young Muslim lad in the reversal of this situation. And you see, in a district where a generation of young girls have been raped, these threats are far from empty. What do you think, if you were working in the school at that time, what do you think what the media done? I think the media fucking blew out of fucking proportion and what the fucking world building at all. I know. But then the media run that Jamal was being bullied. Like... You see, he used to complain that he used to be bullied. There was a, there was another, I think, uh, Kirkley's, Kirkley's guy that came, that Jamal, that Jamal said, somebody got a knife him or something. Mm. I think that, that'd be, that'd be, that, that should be on record. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think when we, we investigated, I think it was a lot of bollocks. I'm, I'm gathering that by reading the school records. That yeah. he, he made accusations and then yeah. when, when they were investigated. Yeah, and there were a lot of bollocks. It lied. Yeah. Now ITV, Piers Morgan. You used your platform to incite hatred of a young child. No time for facts or the inconvenient truth. Surely you must have known the truth because within a few hours of the story breaking, I was receiving dozens of messages from parents, pupils and staff saying there was much more to the story than met the eye. So I did what any journalist could have done, should have done. I asked questions. Were you just being lazy? Was it willful blindness? Or are you just incompetent, Piers? And the BBC's Jeremy Vine. To you personally, was it clinical cowardice? After all, you didn't revol reveal the white boy's name. You just told everyone where to find it on Twitter. Were you afraid of being sued? Although it wouldn't have been the BBC licence fee payers picking up your legal bills, would it? Or was this your Pontius Pilate moment? Condemning a child whilst washing your hands of any responsibility? Because that's what you did, and you didn't seek the truth either. Piers, Jeremy, your lazy, inept reporting was not without consequence, as we will see. You incited hatred, you succeeded. And that's contempt. Your actions 
not Bailey's, led to Bailey and his family being driven from their home in the middle of the night. Like the very refugees you claim you care about. The hate you incited was off the scale. Men with machetes had arrived at the school. Gangs were roaming the streets looking for Bailey. West Yorkshire police told Bailey's mum that terrorism threat had been raised to red. They had intelligence of people coming from Bradford to get Bailey and his family. Rather than deal with a the threat, they moved Bailey and his family to a place of safety. So, whilst one child had the support of the whole country, had the support of the Prime Minister, Sajid Javid, the local football club, everyone rallying behind this child, £160,000 donated to him, the other child in this incident, his family were driven from their home, threats, groups of men looking for him, ready to commit violence against him. And the police, the police stopped the mum. So the police took the family, the police went and got the family to get them out of their house through imminent danger. And they were taking them to relocate them here. Let's have a look. The night in, this is the accommodation that Bailey's mother with two nine-year-old sisters and children were being relocated to. This one-star hotel, where rooms are rented by the hour, next door to a brothel. The Imam, who brought a mob of men up to the school, he has three mosques within a stone's throw of where we're standing now. Bailey's mother, through her sense, looked up this hotel, saw it was owned by Muslims, read the, read the reviews that it's a prostitute racket drug hole, yeah, and got out of the police meat wagon with her children to take them to safety herself. But this is where Kirklees Council were housing those children and that family. This is the most Muslim populated area of Leeds. That family were taken to so-called safety, yeah, surrounded by mosques in what is a Muslim ghetto, yeah, which is why I'm getting bibbed and going to get some cause a scene now. We went to see from neighbours what it was like at the time of the incident. I think it was a, a BMW and X5. And there were about six Persian lads in it. And they threatened to, to firebomb the house. God. Yeah. They so, also they, they threatened to shoot her. They threatened, they to shoot the mum? The mum. They threatened to... Uh, to rape. Kids. Well, they come outside and done all that. Shout and screaming. Shout and screaming. Stuff like that. Well, I saw the video because a neighbour had shared it, and then I saw on the Yorkshire Live um, them making Bailey out to be really horrible and that Jamal was a poor little victim, and it, it wound me up. So I commented on it the victim wasn't a victim, he hit me in the back with a hockey stick. And then within the space of two hours, I had about 250 comments saying that I was lying, that I must have been excluded from the school because I'm a liar. Um, just horrible comments like that. None of them believe in me. And you, did, you take this, did you take the comment down? Um, yeah, I didn't want to, but my mum was worried for repercussions, so she asked me to take it down, so I did. This is the hotel. This is, um, I believe, a four-star hotel. That is totally full of illegal immigrants. This is across the country, so the point to make is that illegal immigrants come here, young fighting age men, not families, not children, and this is where councils house them. Let's have a look. Hello boys. Hello. How you doing? Can I, do you mind if I ask, what, what country are you from, lads? I don't know. No, no speaking English. <laughs> you do speak English. <laughs> do you just what country are you from? Uh, my, Iran. Iran? Yeah. Iran, okay. Yeah, Iran. Kurdistan, Iran. Okay, yeah. nice, no, cool man. I'm just seeing. Is the hotel full? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, full. You enjoying it here? Yeah. Yeah. Nice hotel, nice food. Nice hotel, nice food. Yeah, healthy food. Healthy food. It looks like a nice hotel. Yeah, how many people are in here? I think there are 200. 200? Uh, lots of children? Oh, I, my eye problem, uh, I think it has a little children. No children? Oh, my non children. No, not many children, no. Not many children. But it's a nice hotel. Nice hotel. It is a nice hotel. And if, if, you look at, if you look at where the other family were being housed in Beeston, and you compare it to this four-star four star hotel, nice food, as our friend says. Healthy food. Healthy food. Yeah, right. Hello, bro. Hi. 
How you doing? Hey, do I come back in? Yeah, we're off now, mate. We're only, we're only, we're only, we're done now. That's nice. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what they have in here? They have a full-time doctor and nurses, full-time stationed in here. Full-time. So you know when you can't, my dad tried to get a doctor's appointment earlier. Couldn't get one. Full-time. Full-time. The food's bad? Yeah, The food's bad? Yeah, food's bad. Yeah, Is it free? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's free. I had governors uh, who had friends in the media yeah. who tried to explain to them There's a lot more to this All of that and the F said and you know the whole shebang but it was never picked up in Apart from my reporting there was not a single media statement given the other side of this story The staff knew, other pupils knew They could have exposed the lie Why didn't they? They were even not free to tell you the truth. Well, they were terrified of the consequences. And that's for so-called journalists. Some can't find the truth. Some won't tell the truth. And some, they're afraid of the truth. But me, as a journalist, it's my job to present you the truth. If you want my honest opinion, they said, get up there, this is, I don't know who they is, yeah. get up there and shut that school. Get up there and get rid of this. You see, when the media and politicians decide to kill a story, when they decide to hide the truth from you, they'll do whatever it takes. They shut down the school. It's gone. Everyone lost their jobs. You see, once this lie about a racist attack had gone global, the truth could never be allowed to come out. The real truth, that a young Syrian refugee was struggling to fit into his new environment, was problematic. His allegedly abusive and violent conduct towards teachers and children was allowed to run unchecked. Why? Did the school authorities turn a blind eye rather than be accused of victimising the boy, of being racist towards him? They stayed silent. The truth may have triggered accusations of racism or sparked discussion about immigration policies. The challenges of achieving the successful integration of migrants we welcome into the United Kingdom. And the need to take those challenges seriously. You see, Jamal was one of 20,000 Syrian refugees who come to the UK as part of the United Nations Resettlement Programme. The government could not allow their policies to be examined and the consequences and their incompetence to be exposed. And if you don't think the government is incompetent, you ain't been paying attention to anything. Pretty Patel's been talking tough, really tough, on controlling our borders for years. And yet we have boatloads of illegal economic migrants being escorted across the English Channel and put into these luxury accommodation at your expense. This ineptitude does nothing for the refugees who come here legally, who we welcome into England. Refugees who are trying to integrate and make a new life here. And who was the community's rage directed at? All Syrian refugees. That's who. When in fact, there are many families of Syrian refugees in the area. We're told all of them delightful, working hard to settle and integrate into the country they can now call home. I spoke to multiple refugee families. In the school, problem, uh, my children, no, any problem. No problems with your children? No, no that's it. So you've had, a, you've had a good experience in the yeah, school? Yeah. I used to have two friends and they don't bully and they don't care where from country I come or anything. Okay. And when I talk English, like I was, we was about one month we've been in here and I used to not to speak English very much. So they used to tell me how to speak or that thing. And now I'm in year eight and I know how to speak English and I made more friends okay. and now like, I'm fine. And you're fine yeah. and then no problems. Yeah. I don't feel safe at school. Sometimes I say to my dad, I don't want to go to school anymore. I was just crying and I didn't do nothing because I respect the school rules. Who told Jamal to go on camera and say this? Who arranged the media tour? Who encouraged him to take legal action? He was originally going to sue the school for not looking after him and then decided to sue me instead. Who told him to put this in his statement to the High Court? You see, Jamal doesn't like to break the school rules. Here's the problem. This is his behaviour record. Almost a hundred codes for bad behaviour. Truancy, verbal abuse to teachers, physical violence towards pupils, and lying. <laughs> yeah, there's plenty for lying. You see, 
haven't got all of Jamal's school records. Large sections of documents I was given were blacked out. We tried to get access, but we weren't allowed. And the lawyers wrote to the court to explain they had misplaced documentation. And finally, as you can hear, the lawyers decided what they were going to allow me to see. Whilst I was preparing my defence, Jamal's lawyers decided what I could see. And this global news story wasn't an accident. It was all carefully planned. You see, the day before the video went viral, a GoFundMe page was set up for Jamal. And the video went viral the day after a criminal record check come back on Jamal. Why would his lawyers do a criminal record check? Well, they had to make sure this was financially beneficial exercise, wasn't going to be derailed by an unhelpful past. 15 year old Jamal, his record was clean by the way. Mohammed Akunji, the jihadist lawyer of choice, was immediately on a global media blitz. Listen, a bit of Akunji himself, I'm after him for my own reason. Right, okay. M Nothing what? sinister though, is it? Oh fuck, no, no, journalistic. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> oh, no, 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 fucking totally journalistic. I want to get all the background on him. You reckon he, yeah. you reckon he was a member of that? Yeah. al Midra Haroon are a prescribed terrorist organisation. Almost 60% of terrorists in British prisons are ex-members of this organisation. They kill, they murder, they slaughter. That is the organisation that Mohammed Akunji and his brother were allegedly, according to this top mainstream Muslim British journalist, they were members of it. How does a Syrian lad find himself working with a jihadist lawyer of choice before this video even went out? Before anyone has seen this viral video, within two weeks the lawyers had been made the beneficiaries of the GoFundMe page of £160,000. A plan to sue the school, that's put on hold, and a plan to sue moi <laughs> for libel was launched. What riches had these lawyers promised Jamal and his family? School records were edited. Migration Yorkshire clamoured to make this playground fight about race and hate. They contacted the Home Office as soon as they heard about this playground fight. Yeah, the Home Office, a playground scuffle. Why are they contacting the Home Office instantly? Someone went further, you see? We had this school incident report analysed by a graphologist, someone who analyses handwriting it appears to show that a second person with very different handwriting doctored the report to allege that Bailey had threatened to stab Jamal. Even though all the witness reports mentioned there was only one teacher there, so only one teacher could have done an instant report. So, with the careful planning of the jihadist's favourite lawyer and the enthusiastic support of some useful idiots, it was possible for the lies to go round the world twice before the truth had had a chance to put his pants on. I now need to mention other repercussions of what happened in Ormondbury. I was being sued for reporting the things that were said to me about Jamal. I had to defend myself. The judge had already, already ruled that I was not allowed to argue it was in the public's interest for people to hear a different perspective of Jamal. I had to prove that the information reported to me was true. That's not the kind of burden placed on Piers Morgan or Jeremy Vine. Piers can describe Bailey as vermin without being held to account. And who is behind propagating this deception and the lawsuit against me? You see, this is where we get to meet the most sinister part of the unholy alliance. All sorts of people are helping out, but leading the posse from the front is the jihadist lawyer of choice. He represented Shamina Begum. You know the jihadi terrorist that's out in Syria? He represented, I think, Mike Radabalajo, Lee Rigby's killer. I think he's even had to change his name because he's got such a terrible track record. So this is the lawyer who's suing me, and who the media celebrated that he had served me papers, even though I wasn't in the country. If you've pillaged, if you've plundered, if you've raped and you've beheaded, and you say you've done it in the name of Islam, well, these are the lawyers for you. The lawyers who stepped forward for ISIS bide Shamina Begnam, who've been fighting to get her back into our country, who defended Michael Adabalajo, who beheaded Lee Rigby. This is Mohammed Akunji, and his colleague, Farouk Bajra, who's been banned from claiming legal aid. Yeah, banned from claiming legal aid for putting in fraudulent expense claims. Let me rewind a bit. Let's go back a few weeks. There's an important piece of background information to this. I don't know the full ins and outs of it, but basically to inform that a group call themselves Antifa UK. Yeah. Heard of them? Yeah. yeah. To be honest, I kind of haven't. 
um, and Antifa Dundee it basically says are planning to hurt or possibly kill Tommy Robinson because um, they know where he lives and want to silence him. Um, they've got their hands on, it says they've got hands, uh, hands on some AK-47s and made petrol bombs and stuff. Um, and allegedly say they're going to put um, these petrol bombs through your door when he sleeps. Um, they say they're also planning to attack a few MPs. Now at the heightened tensions with multiple Osman warnings, they now take back the radar phone, the one option we have to go direct to the police, and they are removing it at this current moment. Where are you from? I'm from um, the, uh, 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 the the cash station policing unit that, that Carla works with. Okay. So Carla and I work very closely together. Um, so look, what did you just say? Basically, the the, the radar phone or whatever it is, yeah, what, yeah, yeah. the phone, the emergency phone. That you, that, we, we, we'll be taking that back. You'll be but, taking that back. Yeah, th th those those phones are. Are you for, for a, no, Are you for them. real? Like so. Uh, so when there's a heightened threat and people yeah. have come to the house and the address has been put yeah. out where my kids are, you're then going to take the panic phone back. It's Christmas 2018. The police come to my family's home to tell me that people in Antifa, far left violent extremist organisation, are planning to kill me and my family. See who were the first to comment on this video? Well, Mohammed Akunji of Farouk Bajranko. Of course, the jihadis' lawyers of choice, but also Mike Stutchbury, an independent journalist, an Antifa activist. So the jihadist lawyers knew Antifa were planning to kill me, then actually commented on the video of the Osman warning. You see, what happened next is interesting, although not interesting to the Solicitor's Regulation Authority or the Law Society, the people who should be interested in the integrity of our lawyers. It will be live streamed. I'm not in charge of filming or anything like that. That's uh, down to the guys over here. And yeah, literally nobody wanted to do this, so we thought, what mug can we find who would agree to this? So two lawyers who know Antifa are planning to kill me seek out an Antifa extremist, hire him for one day, just one day, and send him to live stream the serving of papers to my home, my family's home. Papers which had already been served, by the way, with a gang. When my wife and children were there, when they knew I was abroad, lawyers commissioned the Antifa extremist to broadcast my home address in order, as they put it, to cause a spectacle. The law firm or the lawyer who has been, in, you know, sort of taking the lead on the Tommy case wanted to make sure, doubly sure, that, that A, Tommy got the, uh, the, the letter, actually went out two, two, two different ways, and he wanted to make a bit of a spectacle out of it. And this, this is all very, they're very amusing. A group supported by Mike Stutchbury came to the home that my wife and children were in on a Sunday afternoon when I wasn't even in the country. So let's have a look at Mike Stutchbury, who calls himself a journalist, who promoted this event, who shared it and encouraged it, who found it amusing that my wife was so scared she had to ring the police. My wife has been sat down and told in her home that Antifa are planning to kill her. They're planning to kill our family and harm our family. She's been told that she may get acid in her face. Well, how do you think she felt on a Sunday afternoon whilst my children are playing outside on their bikes? To be told that Antifa were on their way to our home. Let's have a look at Mike Stutchby, the man that sent them. Here he is self-admitting that he is part of Antifa. Here he is promoting violence against his opposition. Punch them, punch them, punch them. Here he is hoping that buses full of Antifa get shipped in to smash people's skulls in. Here he is calling for white genocide. Mike Stutchbury is an extremist. He's a far left extremist who currently is playing a victim. He encouraged people to come and he sent people and was part of an organisation that communicated together to send people to the home where my wife and children were when I wasn't there. He even crowdfunded to support them in their action. He, you know, he was looking at various people and eventually he sort of came on to Dick Coughlin, Dick Coughlin, I can't say it properly, um, who is a, a, a YouTuber who has made videos about Tommy for, God, almost 10 years, I think, who's a, who's a real critic. Um, he's a, I don't know if you've checked him out, but he's a, he's a funny guy. Um, Check out, yeah. yeah, he's, uh, he's sort of, you know, he got red hair. Ex he calls, you know, he's, he's an ex-crackhead, basically. 
And who is this Antifa extremist hired to come to my kid's home? Keep watching. Okay, folks, we're here in Sorso. I'm about to be in Murphy. We're about to pop off. I went up to where a number and they said, right, we'll take that from him. We'll make sure he gets it. And later that night, the Antifa extremists hired by their lawyers had a message for me and my children. <laughs> and on that note, see, that, on that happy note, Oh, by the way, Tommy, I am going to mince your kids, mate. Let's have a look at the man that they sent. The man that you can see the Muslim lawyer handing privileged documentation, giving this man my children's home address. The lawyer in this case was a guy called Mohammed Sanimi Akundra, who works for a solicitors in London called, I shit you not, Farouk Bajwa and Co, uh, solicitors of London. I get asked by this guy that uh, they've decided that they're going to, Tommy Robinson is going to be served legal papers uh, so he can be sued by this family. And they asked um, me, do I want to be the one to go along to serve the legal documents? Let's have a look at who Dick Coughlin is. Let's look at some of the things he said. Here he is promoting hatred against black people. Serious, this is a crime. The comments he makes are a crime. Here he is promoting hatred against Pakistanis. Here he is singing a song promoting anti-Semitism. Singing a song about lampshades being made out of Jewish people's skin from the Holocaust. Yeah, third right, third right, you're a good killer kite. We're right, far right, and we're gonna have a fight. You're in the house, bitch. You can go in the guest chamber, then we'll throw you in the pit. We're just following orders, man. We're trying to get paid. You might get out of here, but if you'll be a lampshade. A self-confessed, racist, anti-Semitic crackhead was sent to my children's property. He talked about raping my wife in her skull socket. He talked about my children being fed through a meat grinder. He talked about burning my house down whilst masturbating with my family in it. Now, other than to terrorise my wife and children, why would any sane person do this? It worked, okay? Tipped off by a friend who saw the gang on live stream approaching, my ex-wife hit the panic button and barricaded herself and our children in a bedroom. The police thankfully responded in time. And these are exactly the same tactics being used against the unbelievably courageous children in Ormbury. Threats of violence and rape against children who are willing to stand with me in defence of the truth at the High Court of London. The video release, media, GoFundMe, Antifa, it all happened at the same time. It was coordinated and it was about hate and making money. And how that far left activist, who appears to be an anti-Semitic, Jew-hating, black-hating racist, came to my home with his gang and threatened to kill my children. These lawyers, the mainstream media, they don't care about refugees. They don't care about Jamal. They don't care about the truth. So that bloke who made the video saying he's going to kill the kids. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you, if you didn't do it, I know 100%. Give a statement. I know. I was there. Okay. Give a statement about that. She complained about it. She contacted, well, remember, it would have been the liaison officer at the time to okay. ask if he was arrested. I found out his address and I gave you all the information for him. So even now, right. say now, looking at that, can he be arrested now then? I don't know what happened with the previous report because when we search on our system that we currently use, you probably got buried uh, I can't see any crime report that was linked to it. You see, the next day, knowing I'd been provoked with threats against my ex-wife and my children. No doubt thinking they would catch me conspiring to commit violence and lock me up on a conspiracy charge. Here, outside my ex-wife's house, men in a car that has never been registered, check the registration plate, so presumably from the security services, with listing devices recording what's being said in my home. The involvement of the security services may explain why Dick Coughlin, the man who publicly threatened to murder my children, has never even been spoken to or arrested, despite my wife's complaints. What are you doing? Show me who's in the back of your car. There's no one in the back of the car. So what are you doing then? We're not here anything to do with you. What are you doing then? Well, what, who, what do you think we're doing? 
I think it's something to do with me. No, no, it's not this is what I know. Who's just worth? So what are you doing? And there is someone in the back, I know there's someone in the back. So what are you doing here? I don't know who you are, that's what we need to tell you. Can I tell me what you're doing? Can you tell me what you're doing? Because essentially I've got threats against me. Yeah? So what are you doing here? If I turn it up, you can tell me what you're doing. We Who's in the back of your car? No one's in the back. Who's in the back of your car? You're not going nowhere. You're not going nowhere. I'm not moving. Let me see who's in the back of your car. Tell me what you're doing in my house. I want to know what you're doing, bro. That's all I want to know is what you're doing. I've got police officers sat with a recording, in a recording van. In the back of this van is a recording station. I'm not standing, you're not going, bro. No, because no, what you're doing, I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing. They're sat in the back of their van. This is recording devices. The whole of this back thing, because he just opened it up when I got him out. The whole of this back thing is recording where they're pointing there because they, what this is has been a setup. These people are set. These police officers are setting me up. They're setting me up. It's a setup. They're setting me up by sending people to my house because they think I'm going to react and do something, and they're recording it with listening devices. We checked the vehicle registration plate outside the house on the government website, and there's no such vehicle. Let's not forget the politicians, our fearless leaders. It was only when I went alone to the home of self-declared journalist Mike Stutchby to ask him why he had done what he had and why he thought it was funny to intimidate my children. Some of you may, some of you may have seen that people have been outside my home intimidating my family. The difference is when they come to my home, five men come to my home. I'm on my own. I've had to move my children who are scared and upset. And people encouraged people to participate in coming to my address. One of those such people who... It was only then that the fearless then deputy leader of the Labour Party, Tom Watson, steps forwards. Ignoring reality completely. Every major social media platform other than YouTube has taken down Stephen Yaxley Lennon's profile because of his hateful conduct. Late on Monday night, Yaxley Lennon turned up at a journalist's home, banging on the doors and windows, demanding to be let in. And after being escorted away by the police, he returned at 5am and continued his intimidation. The incident was live streamed. He later warned journalists in a YouTube video to expect a knock at the door. Does the Secretary of State think that he's right that YouTube and the parent company Alphabet continues to give this man a platform? Sir? It'd be funny, you know, if it wasn't so insidious. The hardly honourable Mr Watson totally misrepresented what had happened and from behind his shield of parliamentary privilege bravely declared that I'd been terrorising a journalist. Journalist? Sturchbury's an Antifa activist who incites violence and wants to kill white people. Terrorising. Was I terrorising? Mr Watson bravely demanded that I be removed from YouTube. YouTube had, now, had only recently confirmed that none, not one, of my videos had broken any of their stringent guidelines. And my videos hadn't broken any laws. It was clear I hadn't harassed anyone, certainly not Mike Stutchbury, if indeed he is a journalist. But none of that mattered. My wife and children left their family home that night. They never went back. Thanks to having their lives endangered by the jihadist lawyers. See, my wife started legal action against Mohammed Akunji and Farouk Bajra's firm. But Mo and Co, Mohammed Akunji and Farouk Bajra, you see, they weren't so keen on facing the law as they were on abusing the law to persecute others for financial and ideological reasons. On the 31st of March 2019, they promptly collapsed their law firm. They'll never be involved in the case. That's what they said. And Dr. Farouk Bajra, well, he's no longer going to be a lawyer. He'll be living in Pakistan. That's it. That's what they said. That's how easy it was for Mo and Co to escape justice. Interestingly, they're still signing documents on the case on the 6th of June, months after saying they're not involved. Several other law firms have reported them to the Law Society the body that is supposed to make sure lawyers behave ethically. Nothing's been done. I wonder why. In fact, all the lawyers working at Fruit Basra & Co 
just moved across to a new law firm called Burlington's. And guess what? Yeah, Burlington's took on Jamal's case against me. Fruit Bajwa now works for Burlington's. Fruit Bajwa's son now works for Burlington's. Fruit Bajwa is Burlington's GDPR expert. Pretty ironic, no? Fruit Bajwa and co leaked my children's address to an Antifa activist to put it online for everyone. And if we've been stupid enough to expect more ethical behaviour from Burlington's than from Fruit Bajwa and Mohammed Akunji, well, we'd have been di disappointed. How come Fruit Bajwa signed a form three months after he left then to do with this case? Oh, it, it is absolutely, it was, uh, if, if that was the case, it was before I gave the undertaking and he wasn't involved in this case at all. He signed, a, he signed a form dated June, in June. He signed a form and the date on that form that he signed is June. He left this case in March, apparently. How come? Well, uh, I, 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 if you send it through to me, I'll have a look and I'll give you an explanation as to why. I'm not quite sure what form you're talking about. Although you'll see it on my, you'll see it, you'll see it on my documentary. Okay, so when you when you send me what you decide is relevant, yeah, um, how am I going to know what you've cut out? Um, well, I, I suppose you, you wouldn't. Then, two days ago, Mohammed Akunji docks my mother and father's house. Last night, that house at one o'clock in the morning was smashed to pieces with, with, with bricks through the windows. Yeah, This is all going on in the background. Of the, I've been trying to get my stuff ready, but just so that you're aware of what's going on as to why I don't trust the word you say. When you have Farouk Bajwa's son working for your, working for your company, and Farouk Bajwa is the man that sent people to threaten to kill my children, I'm wondering why in the last 48 hours, or last 72 hours, since I disclosed information to you, why, why my family and loved ones have become under persecuted harm, of which is all detailed with police records and video footage of everything that's been going on. So, and you've covered up things which, and, and, and Luke, Francesca told me, I have a recording of her telling me that your, that Burlington's did not retract anything, yeah. redact anything. Yet in court, you had to admit you did. I've got the recording of her telling me it. Everything was redacted prior to coming to you. Everything was redacted prior to coming to you. And then in court, you sit and admit that you have been redacting things. So uh, forgive me, it's just lie after lie. This is Burlington's lawyers losing documents that they're supposed to send to me and deleting things that they don't want me to see. Misplaced. How do you misplace documents that were electronically filed on their case management system at Fruit Bajra & Co, then passed over to Berlin's? So now he knows that it's coming, that it's gonna land on his lap, the whole lie that they've told, and this is the actions they use. They can't play the man, so they play the kids and the family. You don't, you don't need to be scared, son, yeah? Because, um, they're doing this. Yeah, they just called me and said goodbye. Yeah, I know, baby. But they're purposely just doing that. How do you got my number? But when they're doing this, they're just doing this to try and get cause me shit and make you worry. So I know it's easier said, but you don't need to worry, yeah? They're doing this so they're doing this so that I don't beat them in court. That's why they're doing this, yeah. Mm. And I, I think they do know where we live. Uh no mate. Mm. Danny Barker rang me saying if, he, if anyone turns up to the house, just ring him and he'll come in a minute. Yeah, yeah, he will, mate. Yeah, it's me off. Oh, mate. Alright, cool. The mad thing is, the whole time this goes on, the media and all of them act like we're the bad guys that we've been up with, like I'm the one persecuting people or targeting them. And they're such cowards. They're such cowards, man. I just got a phone call and they said goodbye. I'm so scared, I've told the police, but I'm so scared. Yeah. Hello? Jenna, who's just wrong, Spencer? Uh, we don't know at the minute. What are the police saying? I'm just making a statement. Okay, but just quickly, what are they? What are they? Are they getting that account? Let's put a picture of you online. How, who, who showed you that picture, Jenna? It's on Twitter. Yeah, who I found saw it myself? You saw it yourself. Okay. And yeah. Are they gonna? Are the police sorting out to get rid of it? Yeah, they've taken the address of the Twitter person that's put it out. You, if you can say I've given them fifty addresses of people who have done exactly this over the years. Including the redhead man who. What about the redhead bloke who threatened to kill the kids? What have they said about that? Well, nothing really. 
No, it's a crime. Do you know what I mean? If I make a, if I make a video threatening to kill some kids, I'll be arrested. So, the, the point what you need to ask them specifically and, and say to them, you made a complaint. Someone threatened to murder your children. You had to leave your home. Yeah, those threats have now followed you to where you're now living. Yeah, and they're coming from the same people, the same organisations, the same people they done fuck all about last time. They didn't nick them. They didn't speak to them. They didn't. The solicitor's still acting with impunity, doing it to my mum and dad yesterday. See, you need to specifically ask them, Jen. I want to answer out of them. When you made a complaint against Richard Coughlin, Dick Coughlin, last year, why have they not done anything? And give us and get you a follow up and an answer as to why they haven't done anything, if you can. Mm, and make are the kids all right. Am I right that you managed to track the number? So you know who made those phone calls to her and was... We know where the number it came from yep. um, and who who that phone was registered to. So that's what, obviously we cannot prove... Well, I, I, at that time, I wasn't able to prove who. I only could say where the number it came from. Um, as, in, as, in, as in whose phone it is? Uh, who the phone is registered to. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, obviously, for me, this was this was threatening phone calls a week before a high court trial, trying to of pervert course. the trying to pervert the course of justice. How come no one's been arrested? Um, um, I can't see anything on the crime report. If I send you evidence, which I'm going to anyway, because it's all going to the judge. If I send you evidence of Mohammed Akanji doxing my mum and dad's address, if I send you evidence of criminal damage and attacks in the middle of the night of an old pensioner's, old pensioner's home, and I show you evidence of pictures of my wife being put on ex wife being put online, and my son. They've rung my 11-year-old son's phone. The police are all involved. They've been threatening my 11-year-old son. Yeah? This is what's gone on. If I send you evidence of that, do you think you'll support an anonymity order to protect the children in this case? Stephen, I, I, I can't you know, answer that because I, I don't have instructions to answer that. You know, I, I don't have conduct as a matter. Unfortunately, in terms of integrity, Berlin's don't appear to be any better than Fruit Bajwa and Mohammed Akanji. You see, I was told he'd violently attacked a girl. I was told he'd attacked someone as part of a gang. And I was told he'd threatened to stab someone. In fact, Jamal would violently attack more than one girl. And we presented the evidence to the court, including the testimony of courageous children who came to court. These children weren't Tommy Robinson fans, but they came to the high court to speak the truth. So let me just look at one of the pupils that come to court and testified. This young girl wasn't a supporter of mine, didn't support my politics, but she still came to court and testified. Let me have a look at her school record and read what her teacher says about her. Charlie is a very mature and hardworking member of the form. She has been an absolute pleasure to have in the form. She has represented the form in the school council and in various events across the school throughout the school year. She represents all that is positive and exciting about studying, studying at Almondbury. Charlie is now currently studying law at university. Why would this girl lie, randomly lie, before I was involved? Why would she then travel to the High Court of London and commit perjury? Because that is what the judge has found, that she's made it all up. And Jamal, the Syrian refugee, the one with multiple lies on his school records and behavioural disciplinaries everywhere, well, he was telling the truth. That is what he found in this case. Why would a mother post images and send me those images of her daughter beaten black and blue? Why? For what reason? Why would the staff lie? Why would the head teacher lie? Why would every single person who was recorded covertly lie about what Jamal was like? 12 different people lying about what Jamal was like. Why? You see, the judge has really helped us out here. The judge says, People can lie for reasons that make no sense. Sometimes, for no reason at all. He could not readily identify any explanation for why some of these people were prepared to do so and lie. He concludes the alleged assaults, they never happened at all. Despite Jamal's school record, which you've seen, the judge states, the claimant's record is overwhelmingly positive. He acknowledged Jamal has a record of lying, but decides on this occasion, it's Jamal who's telling the truth, and everyone else, everyone else is lying. Really? 
We waited 10 weeks for this. That's your conclusion. That's the logic from the highest libel judge in our land. There was no jury. <laughs> That's right, there's no jury. All of these people were lying. But Jamal, he was telling the truth. Jamal, who could only find his dad, Jihad, to speak for him. Not a single teacher, not a classmate, not a friend, not a neighbour or a support worker came to court to support Jamal's version of events. Jamal, who says he only broke the rules a few times at school, and even then, it weren't his fault. His school records suggest something very different. I want to be clear and fair to Jamal. He denies every accusation against him, completely and utterly. On the day the five courageous children appeared in the dock, giving testimony against Jamal. Jamal didn't even show up in court that day to face his accusers. Neither did the press. The press actually left court when the witnesses stood up to give their evidence in my defence. It's alarming to think we have this kind of intellect at the top of our judiciary. The story of these two children is actually a story about free speech, or the death of it. It's a story about how the mainstream media is more interested in pushing an agenda than giving you balance and truth. How it continues, despite Leveson, to act with impunity. Is the media held to account for what they report? Have Piers Morgan or Jeremy Vine been held to account? No. It's a story about how the law is being manipulated and exploited by the far left and Islamists to destroy the lives of anyone who speaks out against the accepted so-called progressive, so-called liberal narrative. Or about the poisonous influence of Islam Sharia law in our society. Is the law fit for purpose? No. And it's a story about our government and judiciary's disdain for free speech and the truth, and the lengths that they will go to in order to silence dissent, especially with its new and increasing powers. Is our government being held accountable for its actions? No. Is the judiciary independent of political influence? You've seen all the evidence. You decide. Whether you agree with my politics is irrelevant. When dissent is crushed, free speech dies, and governments move one step closer to tyranny. The lawyers know the truth. Even Jamal's father, Jihad, he knows the truth about his son. They all knew the truth and were using Jamal to further their agenda, regardless of the consequences for Jamal. They continued to pursue the case, which incidentally has caused my divorce and bankruptcy. My ex-wife had to choose between her marriage to me and the safety of our children. I'm glad she chose our children. We're still best mates. You see, Jamal's lawyers told me very early on, if I apologised and paid them 50 grand, they'd drop their case. If you're watching this, you know the decision I made. I won't apologise for reporting what I was told, for what I believe to be true, for standing up for Bailey, a young lad unjustly vilified by pretty much everyone. But in silence in dissent, are the media and our government any different to the governments they criticise so much? China? Russia, Iran, immigration, COVID, Brexit. If it doesn't fit the narrative, you will not hear the alternative view. And where else have we seen this? Where else have the media, politicians, police and social services hidden for truth for decades, fearful of being called racist? Grooming gangs. That's where a cover-up of such horrific cost to thousands of young girls in towns and cities across our country. And nowhere worse than under the stewardship of Councillor Shabir Pandor's Kirklees Council. You see, hiding the truth doesn't protect community cohesion. It does the total opposite. It undermines trust in public institutions. It stokes resentment and conflict in our communities. Tragically, those who lead us don't seem to have the moral clarity or courage to speak the truth. They cause the division that they're trying to prevent. People ask me, was it worth it? Yeah, it was worth it. The truth is always worth defending. I'm still here. If you were born in the United Kingdom, you've already won the lottery of life. An inheritance from our parents and grandparents of freedom, equality under English law and democracy. If we allow ourselves to be silenced, that inheritance is rendered worthless. What legacy will we leave for the children and grandchildren who come after us? None of us 
can afford to let free speech die. We cannot, and we will not, be silenced. If you've just watched this film, you've seen something that they worked tirelessly to hide. They didn't want you seeing it. Which means they're gonna come for me even more. Who knows where I am when you're watching this film now? What I'd ask is, they've taken my security and my stability. The one thing that allows me to continue to fight is knowing my children are safe, knowing they have stability and security in their lives. If you can support me by supporting them, that makes me able to work. If you can support me at www.supporttommy.com Dot com. I can continue shining light to tr on truth and can continue exposing corruption. I thank you in advance for your support. That support will go directly to my family so I can continue to do the work I do. With a peace of mind, knowing that they're okay. Thank you for your support. If you're in America and what you've seen in this film bothers you and you want to prevent it happening in your country, you actually have organisations that are willing to fight against it. One of those organisations you should check out is Justice For All, J4A.US. You actually have organisations and people willing to fight against these injustices, something we don't have in Great Britain.